this evening, John 1, verses 28, 29 now, and 30. John 1, 29, and 30. The next day, John saith Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Our text, beloved, was uttered by John the Baptist on the second occasion he and Jesus Christ met. The first occasion was at Christ's baptism by John at the River Jordan. This second occasion is over 40 days after that, and it is, according to the narrative laid out in John 1, verses 19 and following, day 2. And by the way, I'm not now counting the earlier occasion when unborn John and unborn Christ were in their mother's wombs in Elizabeth's house some 30 years before. I'm speaking of meetings between the two men when they were adults. <coughs> now, the biblical and theological significance of John the Baptist in connection with Jesus Christ was well grasped by Handel, the great composer, in his Messiah Oratorio. Worth mentioning this. Part one of the Messiah begins with several texts from Isaiah 40, the first prophecy of John the Baptist, leading in. Part two of the Messiah begins with John the Baptist's greatest statement. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, which is the heart of our text this evening. Let's consider the Lamb of God, first the beautiful name, then the glorious work, and finally the profound revelation. The Lamb of God, the glorious name, the beautiful name, the glorious work, and the profound Revelation. Now you could say that it's especially appropriate at this time of year to consider our Saviour as the Lamb of God because some of you, I dare say, have seen in the last few days the season's new lamps. At least we have in the field opposite our house. This phrase, the Lamb of God, some of the commentators go wrong in that they think the Lamb of God here must refer to one particular instance of a Lamb in the Old Testament. Some think it means the Lamb that God said he would provide, as Abraham put it to Isaac his son, in Genesis 22, verse 8. Others say, no, it's the Passover lamb which Israel ate before they left Egypt. Others reckon that this is an allusion to the lambs in the morning and evening, which were the daily sacrifices at the temple and before that at tabernacle. Yet others say it refers to the lambs offered for trespasses or even the lamb laid to the slaughter in Isaiah 53 verse 7, the great suffering servant passage, <coughs> or even less familiarly, a reference to a Gentile docile lamb in Jeremiah 11 verse 19. But the truth is, 
that no one instance of a lamb in the Old Testament stands out. This phrase, the Lamb of God, is too indefinite to admit of just one <coughs> referent. But it is certain though <coughs> that the lamb which is intended here is a sacrificial lamb, not a lamb gambling in the field or such like. It's a sacrificial lamb because John's word is, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That's a sacrificial lamb. Now John the Baptist, of course, his father was a priest. And he personally studied the Old Testament closely. So John the Baptist knew fine well that there were various sacrificial animals that he could have used. He could have called Jesus the bullock of God in that, just for sake of argument now, bullocks were offered as a sacrifice. Or the heifer, the red heifer of God, or the ram of God with an R, or goat of God, but he didn't. Out of all the sacrificial animals, John the Baptist called the Lord the Lamb of God. And when I mention these other terms, such as heifer of God, even the children sense that that isn't appropriate. It just doesn't fit. And when we call Jesus the Lamb of God, you know that that's the right one because you're familiar with this text not only. You know it's in Scripture, but you sense that it is attractive and appropriate. It wouldn't do to call Jesus the heifer or goat of God, but a lamb. Yes, that makes sense. It makes sense because we instinctively, and instinctively is the right word, we instinctively think of the characteristics of lambs, the little ones that now appear in the fields. They're lovely, attractive little things. They're innocent and they're typically white, especially the ones that the Bible describes as without blemish or without spot. And so the lamb particularly suggests innocence and sinlessness in a way that a bullock or a ram would. Flowing from the innocence of lambs, lambs are also submissive. And here we come back to two references to lambs that have been cited earlier. Jeremiah <coughs> chapter 11 verse 19 describes himself as a docile lamb brought to the slaughter in that he didn't know that his enemies were setting traps for him. And he went on naively as a lamb to the slaughter, though God delivered him. The Messiah in Isaiah 53 verse 7 is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, did the imagery develop further, in that he didn't open his mouth. He didn't protest. That's the way a lamb is brought to the slaughter. It doesn't know what's coming. It's submissive. It just goes. And so flowing from the attractiveness and innocence and submissiveness, <coughs> lambs are the sacrificial animal par excellence, the number one sacrificial animal in the Bible. Because of that, the Messiah is called the Lamb of God. And as the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus is the sacrificial Lamb pointed to by the Passover Lamb. 
because Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed to us. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. He takes us out of the Egypt and bondage of the world. Christ is our daily lamb sacrifice because the cross cleanses us of our sins all the time, morning and evening, throughout the day. And Christ is our trespass offering, the trespass offering lamb, though sometimes it was another animal than a lamb, to whom we have the forgiveness of sins. So Christ is too the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 who is led as a lamb to the slaughter without opening his mouth. And so we see here there's a collage of various appropriate biblical images <coughs> of the lamb. We don't just say well it's that passage or, or that one but not that one. It's all of them together bringing out different aspects of Christ's work as the Lamb of God. Striking too that John the Baptist has the right <coughs> name for people. Now when Jesus went into the wilderness for his temptation over 40 days of the devil, Mark 1 verse 13 says that being in the wilderness he was with the wild beasts. Well, John the Baptist didn't just spend 40 days in the wilderness, he spent many years in the wilderness. By extension, John the Baptist was with the wild beasts. And so, when the hypocritical scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees came to John, John said, I have the right name, I have the creature for you. You are... And it just wasn't nasty name calling, it was perfectly appropriate and correct. You are a generation of vipers. You're a brood of nasty snakes. That's what John said about these false teachers in the church. And a few weeks or months after that, when John saw Jesus Christ, for the second time, he said, and he, on the other hand, he's like a lamb. He is the lamb of God. And that was a beautiful and appropriate figure of speech. Why, though, is he called the lamb of God? And just as there are several ideas included and combined in lamb, there's a host of biblical images, so it is too with the genitive of God. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God because he is the Lamb that God eternally decreed. Revelation 13 verse 8 and 17 verse 8 speak of him as the Lamb of slain before the foundation of the world. He's the lamb as eternally decreed. He's the lamb that God provided. Again, thinking back to Genesis 22, verse 8. He's the lamb, this lamb of God, of whom God perfectly approves. He is the lamb of God because he is the lamb through whom God works salvation. The Lamb of God. God's Lamb. This of God, also in the Bible, indicates the superlative. The mountains of God are the greatest mountains. The cedars of God are the <laughs> tallest cedars. And so Jesus, as the Lamb of God, is the incomparably great Lamb. <coughs> the one whom all the sacrificial lambs typify. All lambs point 
<coughs> to him. And as the Lamb of God, he is the reality of the Passover. Indeed, he is the reality of the whole sacrificial system. We can say without fear and contradiction, but for the coming Messiah, all this killing of animals, and burning them on altars and sprinkling of blood, <coughs> hither and thither, would all be so much mumbo-jumbo and nonsense. It only has meaning in him. Without him, it's worthless. Because he's the Lamb of God to which everything points. And without him, the whole system collapses as ridiculous. He's the Lamb of God. He fulfills all Lamb sacrifices and by extension, all sacrifices. And so all the external, typical Lamb sacrifices and animal sacrifices, finding their reality in Him, pass away. You can't have Jesus as the Lamb of God and say, well, we ought to kill other animals on an altar and sacrifice them to God. He's the Lamb of God. He fulfills and ends the Old Testament typical system. And so John cries out that famous day, Behold, pause, pause, the Lamb of God. And I added the pause after the word Behold, because it doesn't here mean look at the Lamb of God. Behold here means lo or pay attention. Jesus is saying that John is saying here that famous day in Bethabara by Jordan, pay attention, look, lo, behold, pause, comma, the Lamb of God. He is crying out, therefore, to everyone who can hear his voice, that that one who is coming towards me, that's the idea of verse 29, he is the Lamb of God. Beautiful and amazing name. That he could say that about a man taking steps Closer and closer to him. He's the one to whom all the sacrifices point and the one whose sacrifice will end the whole Mosaic sacrificial system. And the glorious work of this Lamb of God is that he taketh away the sin of the world. And the verb taketh away means lift up and carry off, lift up and carry off. And so this Lamb of God lifts up and carries away the sin of the world. What a burden on a Lamb, a Lamb and on his shoulders is the burden of the sin <coughs> of the world. And if this wasn't Jesus of whom John the Baptist was saying was, was saying these things, you'd wonder, what? Oh, what's this man saying? This John, he says about a human being that he's a Lamb of God who's going to carry away the sin of the world. But things like that are said about Jesus because he is unique and different from every other man has ever been. And if you ask, how is it that Jesus, the Lamb of God, lifts up and carries away the sin of the world, you've got to say, first of all, that he's lifting up and carrying away not his own sin, because he's a lamb without blemish and without spot, as 1 Peter 1 19 says, he's lifting up and carrying away other people's sin. <coughs> Then the question is, how come the sin of the world is made over to him? How can you transfer sin? How can you carry sin? 
How can you bear away somebody else's sin? And the answer to that is imputation. God legally reckoned all the sin of his people to the account of Jesus Christ. And if you ask, well, how then can this sin be carried away by the Lamb? The answer is, it's carried away because Jesus suffers the penalty due to us for our sin. He lifts up and carries away our sin by suffering the punishment due to us for it. The verb and the context suggest this and the Bible's teaching on Christ's atonement requires this. The sacrificial lamb lies in our place. The burden is put on his back and he takes the guilt and punishment away. So that it leaves us and is no longer ours. This is the lamb that God decreed, that God provided, that God approves of, and that God saves us through the Lamb of God. You may have noticed that the verb rendered taketh away is in the present tense, not the past, not the future, the present tense. Which means that even when John spoke those words on day two, in John chapter one, Jesus Christ was accomplishing our redemption objectively. Here's the biblical reform framework for understanding this. From the incarnation onwards, we refer to Jesus as being in the state of humiliation. In the legal state of humiliation. And in that this is a legal state, it means that Jesus was legally guilty for us on account of our sins. And on this basis of his being legally guilty with our sins, he suffered and was humbled throughout his life long. And just as Jesus' state of humiliation, the period in which he's reckoned guilty, is from his conception to his death on the cross, <coughs> so throughout that whole period, Jesus is suffering for our sins. And all that he suffers through the whole period, all the miseries, all the rejection, is because of our sins. Wouldn't be just otherwise for him to suffer anything at all unless he were guilty for our sins. Lifelong suffering, lifelong suffering, especially during his public ministry, which began, of course, when John baptized him at the Jordan. And lifelong suffering, not only especially during his public ministry, but even within that period, even more so during the cross. So our Lord's Supper form has it right, and it states that Christ bore for us the wrath of God, under which we should have perished everlastingly, from the beginning of his incarnation to the end of his life upon earth, from the beginning of his incarnation. This is the teaching, too, of our Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer 37. What dost thou understand by the words of the Apostles' Creed, he suffered? Answer, that he, all the time that he lived on earth, but especially at the end of his life, sustained in body and soul the wrath of God, all the time that he lived on earth. And here we have John 1 verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away, which is 
currently, now, presently, taking away the sins of the world. He was a lamb who was bearing sins, even as John spoke of him that day at Bethabara. You could put it like this, that just as all his life long, Jesus was obtaining and meriting righteousness for us by his lifelong obedience, so, on the other hand, all his life long, Christ was suffering the wrath due to us for our sins which were imputed to him. We may also add that it is on the basis of his lifelong accomplishment of our redemption that Christ then continually applies redemption to us subjectively throughout our Christian lives. By faith, the believer continually receives the forgiveness of his sins and the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now John, of course, could have very easily spoken of the sins of the world, plural. But he didn't do it. He spoke deliberately of the sin, singular, of the world. And so here, the perspective is that of all the sins of the world combined, rolled together into one massive, gigantic burden, a vast, crushing weight laid on the back of the Lamb of God who then lifted it up and carried it away from us by his lifelong suffering and atonement and especially at the end of his life on the cross. Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The world here does not mean absolutely everybody, head for head. Many, even when John spoke these words 2,000 years ago, many had already died. Many were already being punished in hell for their sins. The world here stresses that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who saves by bearing away the sins not only of Jews but also of Gentiles, people of every kindred, tribe, nation and tongue. The Lamb of God, think now of John's first hearers, the Lamb of God to them would make them think Ah, all that imagery in our Bible. The Lamb of God dies for Jews. That's what happened in the Passover. The daily offering wasn't raised up to God for the Babylonians or the people in India or China. It was the offering for Israel. Thanks to the trespass offering for Jews who transgressed And if you would have pushed some of these nationalistically minded Jews, they might have said, well, he, he who sacrifices were for the sins of Gentiles too. Gentiles who had been grafted into the nation of Israel. Because the Passover could have been eaten by some Gentile who had been circumcised and joined the Jewish nation. Same thing with the daily offering and the trespass offering. John the Baptist says about Jesus that he bears and takes away the sin of the world. Not just the Jews, not only Gentiles who have become Jews, but the world. <coughs> Gentiles as Gentiles who keep their nationality. It's interesting too, if you think of that man 
whom God would provide the lamb about which Father Abraham spoke to his son Isaac. That lamb was a lamb for a son of Abraham. John the Baptist knew something about the children of Abraham. He knew, and he told the people this in his preaching, that many of the Jews weren't really the children of Abraham at all. And he said to them that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. You're not the children of Abraham, and it's easy for God, if he will, to make children of Abraham out of the stones this litter, littering this desert floor. Oh. God did that. God raised up children for Abraham out of the Gentiles. And most of the children of Abraham today are Gentiles, not Jews. And most of the total children of Abraham since the beginning of the world, I dare say by now, are Gentiles, not Jews at all. In Galatians 3 is very clear in this. All those who believe in Jesus Christ are the real children of Abraham. It's not a matter of physical descent or of blood. And these are the ones, these are the world, who sin Jesus Christ bore away. And now we need to pause for a moment and ask this question and understand it. How come? How come John the Baptist is able to make such a profound statement about the Lord Jesus Christ and his work? How come <coughs> he is able to say of Jesus that he is the Lamb of God? That he is going to be sacrificed for sin? And that he is going to die, not just for Jews, but for the world. How come, in the history of redemption to this point, John is able to say this? How come John the Baptist is able to say this, when this is some time before Caesarea Philippi, when Peter, finally, was able to confess after many months of being with Jesus and much instruction, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was able to understand there and see who Jesus was. Then, having understood Christ's office, or person rather, he misunderstood Christ's work. It was Christ that goes on to say, Now you've got that straight. Now you're clear as to who I am. You must now know that the Messiah must be betrayed and arrested and beaten and suffer and be crucified and rise from the dead on the third day whereupon Peter said, oh no Lord, you can't do that, that's not appropriate. That never. Whereas John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world and he has a better grasp of it than Peter does some months, if not years down the line. How come John the Baptist is able to say this before the cross? How come John the Baptist is able to say this before Christ is raised from the dead on the third day? How come John the Baptist is able to say this before Pentecost? Before the Spirit is poured out and the church began to understand what Jesus had been saying to them all along through the illumination of the Holy Spirit. How come? I want to lay down a few basic things in general right at the start. Number one, John's confession, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, is the high point in all of John's statements about the Lord Jesus. That's my personal view, and you can think back to what we've seen in this series, and you can bear that in mind in the remaining sermons. But this is the highest point, to my mind at least, that John reaches. Secondly, 
Though I've been explaining these terms, the Lamb, the Lamb of God, taking away the sins of the world, and that indeed in the biblical framework these words mean what I've been explaining them to mean, I'm not claiming that John the Baptist understood all of the things that I've been saying and in all of their connections. And also though John makes this <coughs> bold, clear confession here on day two, as John 1 structures it, this doesn't even mean that throughout his whole life John clearly understood and clung to this, especially as we will see, Lord willing, when he was in prison. Those things said right at the start, I'd like you now to think of the development of John the Baptist's understanding of the coming Saviour. Think of him as a boy. Think of him with regard to the passage in Luke chapter 1, when it would have been passed on to him what the angel Gabriel said about him and his work and the coming Saviour. And he would have filed that away. What his mother Elizabeth would have told him, including of that day when she, carrying John, and Mary, carrying Jesus, met in their living room. What his father Zacharias would have told him, including Zacharias' inspired prophecy at the end of Luke 1. He's building a picture. Then too, John the Baptist would have studied closely the Old Testament prophecies concerning himself and his witness to the coming one. In that passage in Isaiah 40, the one which predicts the voice crying in the wilderness, tells us something very important about the one whose way John was to prepare. He came to prepare the way of the Lord. Jehovah. Take that seriously, John. The one whose way you're going to prepare is Jehovah. Later on, that passage says, He came to prepare the way of our God. Verse 5 of that same chapter says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. The glory of the Lord. The Lord. Over God and his glory is going to be revealed that you are going to prepare his way and see him. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. And that points to the Gentiles, the world. Not just all Jews shall see it together but all flesh Think about the prophecy that concerns yourself, John. All flesh is going to see the glory of the Lord, our God, Jehovah. He's building up a picture here about the one whose way he's going to prepare. The second prophecy from the Old Testament about John and his work says that John goes before the messenger of the covenant. Christ is called the messenger of the covenant. The one who embodies and represents God's friendship with man. He's the one in whom Israel delights, the messenger of the covenant, whom they delight in. And that delight is the worship and adoration and praise of the whole Old Testament church. That's the first commandment. And then this messenger of the covenant suddenly comes to his temple. He owns the temple. And who else can own the temple but Almighty God who is worshipped there? And then when this messenger of the covenant comes suddenly, the one in whom Israel delights, he comes to his temple, verses 2, 3, and 4, go on to say, from Malachi 3, that he comes to purify and refine the church. He purges the sons of Levi 
so that now they can offer unto God an acceptable sacrifice. Even the Old Testament prophecies <coughs> about John and his work clearly reveal the wonder of this coming Savior. He owns the temple. He's the one that Israel had been worshipping for centuries, the one in whom they delight. He purifies the church. These are all divine works. And then, when John begins his ministry, he understands and preaches the Messiah's pre-existence. Verse 30, John 1. John says about this Jesus walking towards him. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And here John mentions two things. That he was a little bit older than Jesus. So Jesus comes after him. And secondly, not only does John come before Jesus as to their human nature, but secondly, Jesus, chronologically, is before John. After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. <coughs> and the way in which Jesus was before John is that Jesus pre-existed John, that is, existed before John, and pre-existed the creation. John 1 verse 15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I speak, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And that same prologue of John explains what it is for Jesus to be before John. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. John understood. That's what the words mean. That Jesus is pre existent before the world. So John's preaching this. About this coming Messiah, but he doesn't yet know Jesus to see. And I'm going to touch on something that may have remained a question mark to you after this morning's sermon. I deliberately left it to this sermon because it fits in better here. John the Baptist doesn't yet know Jesus to see before the baptism now. Verse 31 I knew him not. Verse 33, I knew him not. John couldn't have told you what Jesus looked like. Never spoken to him before until John came to him that day to be baptized. Before that day, the two of them had never met. They had never conversed. They didn't know each other to see. And this makes it very clear that there was no collusion between them. They didn't come together, plan it, and say, well, John... Toss coins, and then you can be the big religious leader right here, Jesus, if you taught it. And then I'll back you up, and we'll pretend to support each other in our work, but it's all just one big thing. No, they had never even met before. That's the point. No collusion. And then one day, Jesus came to be baptized by John. And either Jesus, in coming to John, said, first of all, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. Mary is my mother. And then John would have said, Oh, Mary told me that story. I'm sorry, my mother Elizabeth told me that story. Then you must be the Messiah. We've met before when we were in our mother's wounds. Or else, Jesus came to John and said, John, I am the Messiah. John, temporarily overwhelmed with the magnitude of that, thought, well, I can't baptize you. And then Jesus reminds him, no, your calling is precisely to baptize me and ordain me to my office, whereupon John baptizes Jesus with water. Then, 
After John baptizes Jesus, we have the three wonders. Heaven opens. The Spirit, in the likeness of a dove, descends from heaven and rests and abides on Christ. And a voice says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And now John knows, with an even greater certainty, this is happening exactly as God told me some time before. Jesus really is the one. This is the Messiah. And he's the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And since he baptizes with the Holy Spirit, he is the Son of God. And then Jesus leaves. Goes off for 40 days to be tempted in the wilderness. Which means that John has six weeks, six weeks or thereabouts, to think further on that great day at the Jordan, six weeks before Christ returns from his wilderness temptations. And he may well have thought in that intervening time about the dove. The dove. If the dove descends upon Jesus, and the dove represents innocence and harmlessness as a bird, what sort of an animal is especially innocent and harmless? There aren't too many, but surely at the very least, lamb would have to feature prominently. The dove is a particularly lovely and beloved bird, as pictured especially in Scripture's Song of Solomon. So too a lamb. And now there's something that I've been saving until now, something else <coughs> about a dove. In fact, one dictionary article that I read about the dove put this very first in its first line. I quote, The dove is... Above all, a bird for sacrifice. From your knowledge of the Bible, if someone said to you, what's the number one bird you think of in connection with sacrifice? Because they weren't all animals. The answer would be a dove. Just as the lamb is the number one animal that you should think of in connection with sacrifice. The dove comes upon Jesus Innocent, beloved, bespeaking, equipping him for his sacrificial work as the innocent and lovely Lamb of God. And the Lamb dies for the salvation of the world. Which brings in the new creation. The new creation with respect to individuals, because if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature or new creation, as 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, and the new creation also regarding the cosmos, the physical world of God made in the beginning. I am the voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Isaiah 40. John must have read Isaiah. It talks there about the Lord who's coming, one who is elect and chosen, and whom God's soul delights. The suffering servant of Isaiah 42 and 49 and 50 and 52 and 53 and even 61 and even 63. But especially 53, the suffering servant, the one who goes as a lamb to the slaughter and doesn't open his mouth. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. You can see, thinking scripturally, in the light of John's past, how he got to that. And the other thing we need to note is that John is a prophet. As a prophet, John got direct revelation, including the particular direct revelation that was mentioned this morning. God said to him, 
you're going to see the Spirit one day descend upon a man in the form of a dove. And that one, so identified and so manifested, is the Messiah who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And God could have said to John the Baptist all sorts of things. And one of the things that he did say to John, by the Spirit, came out of John's mouth that day was, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is John's witness. And what you do with a witness is you either believe the witness or you reject the witness. You either say that's a true, faithful witness or you reject it. And those who believe the witness of John concerning Jesus as the Lamb of God they're forgiven all their sins. And those who reject the witness of John and despise the Lamb of God, the writer of the fourth gospel, John, describes their lot as the wrath of the Lamb. He's harmless and innocent in his first coming. But when he comes back, it's the wrath of the Lamb. He either bears God's wrath against you for your sins, or you bear His wrath against you for your sins. 